All right, welcome everyone to Ask the Pastor. I'm your host, Blake Gideon, Senior Pastor of Edmonds First Baptist Church. Uh, we have three questions for today, and so let's dive right in. The first question is this. What are your beliefs on predestination in terms of individual souls being saved? Does God decide who will be saved and who won't be saved before any of us have come to be? Well, uh, you know, here we again, we're here we are again addressing that question of predestination. Uh, I have dealt with this on numerous occasions, not only on Ask the Pastor, but also on uh, my other podcast, Engaging the Mind. I have a whole archive of theological lessons that I've taught on Engaging the Mind, and you can always go back to those archives, and you can find where I have taught on predestination, election, the sovereignty of God, and so forth. And now I'm going to go ahead and deal with it here today, um, but this is a common question that people have. I guess that's the reason I have to deal with it so much. Um, but, but the questions are, you know, the per person asked are, are, is this, is what are your beliefs on predestinations in terms of individual souls being saved? So the person asking, what do I believe? Okay. Well, first of all, I believe in predestination because predestination is in the Bible. Okay. Um, you know, you, you, you got that, you, you got the passage in Romans, um, where God says, uh, for, for, um, for those whom he foreknew, this is Romans 8, 29, for those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, or that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called, and those whom he called, he also justified. So I, obviously, I believe in predestination. I think any Bible-believing Christian has to believe in predestination. The question is, is what do you believe about predestination? Now, I don't want to give, get into all the theological terms, such as supralapsinarianism, infolapsinarianism. I just want to try to keep it, try to keep it simple. Really, you want to know of, of uh, what really your question is, is do I believe in double predestination? Do I believe that God, before we were ever created, that God determined who would go to heaven and who would go to hell. I mean, that's, that's supralapsinarianism, the fancy word for it. Uh, others refer to it as double predestination. Well, I'm going to tell you what I believe, and I'm going to answer it from the Scripture. Nowhere in the Bible does, dam does God place damnation as a result of His predestination. Uh, for example, when you look at the book of Romans, uh, the cause of damnation is always Adam's sin and uh, the fact that we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So I do believe that God predestines those who are saved and those whom are not, who are not. But the result of damnation is never placed upon God's predestination. Um, it is always placed upon Adam's sin, original sin, and the fact that we've all sinned. The Bible teaches that we are all dead in Adam, not dead because of God's predestination. We are all dead in Adam, okay? And uh, so I do believe that, uh, uh, that God predestines those who are saved, and those who are not saved are damned because of their own sin, okay? Now, I also want to tell you, I want to stretch your mind and get you to think with me just for a moment is how, how, you know, you really can't talk, you can't, really can't talk about predestination without, you know, talking about election. And uh, uh, election first appears in the Bible in the Old Testament when God chose Abraham and then God chose the nation of Israel. So that is God's election. Uh, God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So the question is, is did God, here's my question, did God predestine Abraham to be his chosen one? Before the foundation of the world, do you believe that God predestined Abraham to be used of God to, to, uh, to usher in a great nation? Well, I, I believe the answer is yes. I, I believe that according to uh, the eternal decrees of God, God decreed even before a Abraham was ever even born, even before creation, I believe that God decreed that Abraham would be his chosen vessel that he would use to usher in a great nation. Now, which brings us to the next question. 
did God choose Abraham because there was anything special about Abraham? Was Abraham six foot tall? Was he beautiful? Was there something attractive about Abraham that caused God to choose him? The answer is no. I mean, Abraham was a, a pagan worshiper in a foreign land, and uh, but God sovereignly chose Abraham. Not because anything that Abraham had done, God simply sovereignly chose Abraham to be his, his, his uh, elect tool, his elect means of ushering in a great nation. And again, did God choose, did God elect Israel because there was something special about them? No, as a matter of fact, they were the smallest of the nations. God simply chose Israel by his sovereign grace. He chose Abraham simply as the result of his sovereign grace. Why? Because he had predestined to do this before the world was ever created. We also look into the New Testament and we see that God saved the Apostle Paul the same way. I mean, as a matter of fact, the Apostle Paul was on his way to persecute Christians. He was not even looking for God. And he was persecuting followers of the way, those who follow Christ. And all of a sudden, God appears to him, supernaturally saves him. God chose Paul. He, he saved Paul by his sovereign grace. And I believe that God predestined that before the foundation of the world, according to Ephesians chapter 1. Okay, now God saved. Now, if you look at that, God saved Abraham the same way he did, or saved Paul the same way he did Abraham. Why? Because God's salvation has always been by the has always been the same way, the result of His sovereign, electing grace. So the question is: Is how are you saved? You're saved the same way. You are saved by God's sovereign, electing grace. God saved you. He he. He granted you life. He granted you faith. He granted you repentance. He, he drew you unto Himself. You were dead in sin, but He made you alive. And I believe that He determined to do that before the foundation of the world. Okay? So, yes, God does predestine those who are saved unto eternal life. But, I, but, but the damnation, the damnation of the non-saved is never... Um, attributed to God's predestination, even though if God does, if God, if he did, if he does work that way, he's perfectly good in it. But the scripture always points the, the consequence of damnation to the fact that we've all sinned in Adam. Okay. So the picture I like to think of, uh, of is like, is like this, is that, that all of us, when Adam sinned, all of creation sinned against God. And out of, that, out of that pool of damnation, God chose a people for himself. Okay? All, of, all were damned. All deserved to go to hell because, because all had sinned. And out of that pool of damnation, God chose a people whom him, for himself whom Christ would come and die. And so that's more of that understanding of infilapsinarianism. Did God predestine before the fall or did God predestine in light of the fall? That's the that's how you that's the difference between superlapse and Arianism, double predestin double predestination and infilapse and Arianism after the fall or in light of the fall, which is that idea that damnation is the result of sin, but God in His sovereignty has chosen an elect people to save, for whom Christ came and died. Okay, so that's my view. All right, um, and I hope that answers your question. I believe it does. Uh, second question I have for today, uh, and really this is two questions in one. The person asks, do believers fast today and what does it involve? And then the second question is, how can we know that it is the Holy Spirit that is working in our lives and not just our mere conscience? Okay, these are great questions. You know, the question is, is do believers fast today? I think believers should fast. I don't know if they do or not. I know that uh, I do, and I don't do it as much as I should. But there are times in my life where I fast, and the purpose of my fasting is usually because, I'll just be quite honest with you, I fasted because I've had a stronghold in my life that, I, that in the power of my own flesh, I haven't been able to overcome. So I've gone to God in fasting to seek His help in overcoming a specific stronghold. And usually, 
you know, most of the time when, when fasting is referred to in the Bible, it's always in reference to denying self, denying oneself food. And so when I fast, that's typically the way I fast. I deny myself food. Um, um, and it can look different for everyone. I deny myself those things. I know when Daniel fasted, he only ate fruits and vegetables. And so uh, I don't know that it's about how you fast as, it mu- as, as, as much as it is why you fast. And so I, do, I think it's a lost discipline. I think believers should fast, especially if they've got a stronghold in their life and they're truly seeking God's help to overcome. Or, you know, if, if, they've, if they've experienced a stagnant period in their spiritual development, it's always good to fast, uh, you know, to, to help you and to get through that stagnation. Or if you're seeking God's will or seeking God's guidance concerning a specific, you know, uh, a move, a, a, a job, uh, you know, one of your kids are rebellious and you need to fast and pray. And so I don't know if believers fast or not. I know, I know a remnant do and I know more should. OK. And uh, what does it involve? Well, it can, you know, typically in the Bible, it's, it's it involves abstaining from certain kinds of food or abstaining from food as a whole. OK. I know some people fast from coffee and things like that. Again, I think the issue is more about the heart more than the method. Even though the method is important, it's more about the heart. Number two, you ask, how can we know? that it is the Holy Spirit that is working in our lives and jo- not just our mere conscience. Well, I, I think you have to ask yourself, is, it, is the work in your life biblical? Is there a biblical work taking place in your life? And if so, that's the work of the Spirit. We, we never desire the things of God. We, ne- we never desire to win people to the Lord. We don't desire to obey God's Word. We don't desire to worship as we should. Um, but when we do, it's the work of the Spirit. OK, and um, um, and I think a lot of times the, the Holy Spirit works through our conscience. OK, sometimes people have a seared conscience. Other other times people have a very sensitive con- conscience that causes them to have judgment that, that causes them to have strict judgment on themselves. But oftentimes the Holy Spirit works through our conscience in the way to determine whether it is truly the work of the spirit is to ask yourself, is it biblical? And if it's biblical, then you know it's a work of the Spirit of God. Okay? Um, number th- my third question for today, is our sin nature masked by our culture as mental illness? Can we say, uh, could we say that we all, or could we say that we all mental illness is really just our sin nature on display? Question's a little bit choppy. For example, a narcissist is prideful, selfish, arrogant, manipulative. But isn't this how all humans are apart from Christ? Okay, well, first of all, you're, you're getting into a field that uh, is outside of my expertise. Here's what I do believe. I do, that, I do believe that mental illness is a reality, okay? And not m- all mental illness is the result. Oh, yeah. I want to be careful in what I say, so hear me out. All mental illness is the result of sin because we live in a sin-fallen world. And uh, if sin didn't exist, mental illness wouldn't exist. But not all mental illness is directly sin. Sometimes it is a medical, physical abnormity or whatever it may be, uh, in, in, uh, a, a chemical imbalance or whatever people may want to call it, bipolarism. You know, I do believe that mental illness is real. Okay, let me say that. And I believe that those who struggle with mental illness need to get help. But not all things that are labeled mental illness are mental illness. You're right. Some things are just sin and people need to repent. I mean, I think that label gets thrown around a lot. Like you say, there's someone who's a classic narcissist and they're prideful and they're selfish and they're self-promoting and they're boastful and they're arrogant. And what they need is salvation. But yet, in many cases, they're labeled as having a mental illness. So I do agree with you that not all things that are labeled mental illness are the result of mental illness. Sometimes it's just people who need to repent and get saved. But I do believe that mental illness is a reality. And, and those of us who are not 
trained in that area need to be very careful about what we say and about what we do. Now, we always want to stand upon the Word of God, and I do believe that the Bible has answers for people who struggle with mental illness. I believe that Christ is the answer to mental illness. I believe that the, the, that the, the Bible is, 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 is sufficient to address those issues. But I also believe that there is something in, in a lot of people, there's something physically wrong, and they need to seek help in people who are trained in that area, medical professionals. All right? So thank you for your questions today. God bless you. Um, look forward to your questions next week.